Welcome to the MIT Center for Art, Science, and Technology's 2021 Symposium, Unfolding Intelligence, the Art and Science of Contemporary Computation. CAST was established in 2012 with the goal of building and building on connections between the worlds of art, science, and technology. This is the third in a series of symposia that CAST has convened since then, and as with its predecessors, we bring together artists, scientists, engineers, and humanists from within MIT and from the world at large to discuss areas of rapidly evolving research and urgent social relevance, and to find in that dialogue stimulation, confirmation, provocation, intersection, and we hope common purpose. At MIT, CAST partners with departments, labs, and centers to integrate the arts across the curriculum to enrich and encourage artistic collaboration and to provide support to faculty and members of the MIT community as they pursue their own artistic practice and or research. In addition to symposia like this, CAST facilitates the sharing of this creative work beyond the Institute by producing concerts, exhibitions, and publications and making them available to the public. So thank you for being with us today. We hope you will join us throughout the week at virtual events addressing the aesthetic, technical, and critical issues pertaining to artificial intelligence and computational media. We also look forward to seeing you on Friday, April 9th, as the symposium culminates with a live interactive event to which all attendees are invited and which you can join presenters and artists in breakout rooms to explore hidden threads between all that has been discussed this week. Welcome to our welcome to our panel on bias and the AI for uh, uh, for uh, exploring all of the kind of issues where we can understand how algorithms have been leveraged for a number of technological advances at the same time as encoding a number of types of discriminatory practices uh, these days. Terms like bias in AI and algorithmic bias have nearly entered the common parlance these days, but it wasn't always the case. Even though you know, many technologies of uh, you know, many technologies in the past have also implemented bias. So, for example, we could think back towards collaborative filtering algorithms, commonly used and uh, and uh, commonly benefited from today, whether it's from recommendations for purchases or songs and uh, so forth. At the same time, when you look at how collaborative filtering algorithms work, these algorithms that are frequently used in recommender systems, you can say that they build consensus in a particular way that can encode bias. That is, you can think about a collaborative filtering algorithm as a very is working on a very sparse matrix. That is, if you imagine a kind of a system where you have all of the users of the system along a vertical axis and all of the items that can be recommended along the horizontal axis, you're going to know, then the system is going to try to figure out for each, for each cell, would that person want to purchase or understand or use that particular item? So you can see that most of those cells aren't going to be filled and the algorithm is going to have to try to fill it. It would do so by trying to find networks of users like-minded users and build consensus, show those items to those users more, and then you have this escalating process of consensus building, in which case all of the individuals will tend to converge towards similar preferences. In fact, in the early literature around collaborative filtering algorithms, people who didn't fit neatly into the rubric were called in early papers either black sheep or white sheep, tellingly. Fields such as computer-supported cooperative work within uh, computer science have long looked at issues like the socio-technical gap, you know, trying to understand why systems often fail for social reasons rather than technological reasons. Thinkers such as Phil Agri have, uh, and Terry Winograd have been uh, critics of AI and uh, Phil you know, in particular suggesting this idea of critical technical practices where we consider their foundations as we think about how we engineer systems. And in sociology of science, we have people like Bruno Latour, you know, who would look at how people and systems uh, all within the same network exchange values with one another. 
Now the term bias in AI you know, has, you know, has proliferated in part because of the use of artificial neural networks. These used to be you know, used 20 and 30 years ago, primarily either for particular classes of engineering problems or in cases where computer scientists wanted enhanced biological plausibility. However, 20 years ago, they weren't as, in as widespread use as today because such uh, uh, systems were criticized for a variety of reasons, such as biologically pl biological plausibility, as we learned that it's not just whether a neur neuron fires, but the rate of fire and much more that determines its operation within the human brain. But now with the inception of deep learning, the classes of problems have, have expanded immensely that uh, artificial neural networks can approach. And because of this proliferation of using artificial neural networks, the you know, implosion with the enhanced media attention around particular kind of social issues of uh, bias, then this topic of bias in AI has become more well known. Uh, as, uh, as Jeff Balker and Lee Starr have uh, put it, we can combine our, uh, our technical and uh, scientific approaches with the wisdom of race critical and feminist scholarship in order to more completely understand the kind of operation of these systems. Hence the panel for, from today is aimed to allow us to benefit from the insights of computer science, sociology, reflective technologies from the arts, all to gain different perspectives on the issue of bias and uh, AI. And I wanna finally just mention one other point related to bias in AI before I begin to introduce our, uh, our panelists. It's that we can turn the lens around. Yes. Yeah. So I've been very pleased in some of our own work to use deep learning or statistical techniques such as archetypal analysis to, to try to understand wide, widely used systems such as uh, avatars in games and social media, social media profiles and more and, and expose the kind of biases and, and uh, you know, that they tend to implement, such as not being optimized for particular categories of people with, as, as, uh, as regards to race or gender in particular. So to begin with, uh, I mentioned uh, benefiting from the wisdom of uh, sociology, computer science, and the arts. We have, first of all, Ruha Benjamin, who specializes in interdisciplinary study of science, medicine, technology, race, ethnicity, gender, and knowledge and power. She's the author of People, Science, Bodies, and Rights on the Stem Cell uh, Frontier and Race After Technology. Uh, she is a professor at uh, Duke University. She has written uh, numerous articles and book chapters, been awarded fellowships and grants from the National Science Foundation, Ford Foundation, and uh, much more. In uh, computer science and information science, we have John Kleinberg. His research focuses on interaction of algorithms and networks and the roles they play in large-scale social information systems. His work has been supported by NSF Career Award, uh, ONR Young Investigator Award, MacArthur Fellowship, Sloan Foundation Fellowship, and much more, as well as grants from Facebook, Google, Yahoo, MacArthur Foundation, and the NSF, and uh, many other organizations. And in terms of reflecting on these kinds of systems, we have Benaz Farahi here, who is an award-winning designer, critical maker you know, based in Los Angeles, who holds a PhD in interdisciplinary and media arts and practice from the USC School of Cinematic Arts. She explores how to foster an empathetic relationship between the human body and space, using uh, uh, space around it using computational systems, addressing issues ranging from emotion to social interaction. And she uses fabrication techniques along with computational design in her work. Her work is in the permanent collection, the Museum of Science and Industry in, in Chicago. She's been exhibited internationally in Ars Electronica and more and featured across the popular press ranging from BBC to The Guardian, Wired and uh, many, other, uh, many other journalistic venues. And finally, she is also uh, 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 a she is also you know, a recipient of many fellowships uh, too, such as the Rock Hudson Fellowship. So I'm very, very pleased to have uh, these uh, distinguished panelists uh, with us here today 
First off is going to be uh, Ruha Benjamin. You will see uh, a recorded uh, video of her speaking and afterwards we'll return for a few live clarifying questions before continuing on with our other panelists in a similar for format and then going to uh, a broad panel discussion and Q&A. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it off and begin the uh, and begin Ruha's presentation. Thank you so much for the invitation to be part of this conversation. When it comes to our theme, unfolding intelligence, I want to suggest that to talk about intelligence is to talk about eugenics. For many people, the E word conjures a particular place, Nazi Germany, forgetting that the Nazis learned from US-based scientists and doctors and that Hitler called Madison Grant's book, The Passing of the Great Race, his Bible. The word eugenics also conjures a specific time period that we have supposedly passed, when in fact, eugenic logics and imaginaries continue to infect so many areas of our contemporary lives, from the way patients are treated and triaged to the way that school children are ranked and rated. In short, the eugenics period never ended, but rather unfolded, mercurial, in the way that it has taken on different forms and functions, including in our present age of AI. For our conversation today, I want to briefly highlight the entanglement between eugenics and statistics. And since we're still in the midst of the spring semester, I'd like to assign some homework and encourage everyone to read this article authored by Aubrey Clayton a few months ago, published a few months ago. In it, she writes that ideally, statisticians would like to divorce these tools from the lives and times of the people who created them. It would be convenient if statistics existed outside of history, but that's not the case. Statistics as a lens through which scientists investigate real world questions has always been smudged by the fingerprints of the people holding the lens. Statistical thinking and eugenicist thinking are in fact deeply intertwined. And many of the theoretical problems with methods like significance testing, first developed to identify racial differences, are remnants of their original purpose to support eugenics. In other words, eugenics haunts any discussion of, of intelligence. So if statistical thinking will not save us, what will? Black feminist thought, of course, and here I draw upon the wisdom of Toni Cade Bambara when she writes, not all speed is movement. Again, this idea could be applied to so many different areas of our lives, but here I want us to think about it in the context of technological development, which too often is conflated falsely with social progress. Technological development can actually reinforce and sediment social inequalities. In fact, its default settings should have it that we shouldn't be surprised when it does. And you know, this idea is easier to translate and to shape our critical thinking when it comes to the past. It's easier to recognize when technology and data have been used to harm different groups, whether it's the deadly data uh, that I IBM helped in supporting the Holocaust in terms of punch cards to surveil and track populations that were eventually exterminated. But it's harder, I think, to apply this to our present, especially when it comes to what we might call do-gooding data, where the framing and the motive is to purportedly help different groups. In this case, a, a quick example comes to us from Minnesota, where the public school district there and the police department joined forces under the umbrella of what they call the Innovation Project. And you know, this was a project that intended to collect and centralize data from a, a number of different local agencies in order to um, help predict the riskiness of young people, their risk of having future encounters with law enforcement. 
the do-gooding aspect was that these agencies hope to intervene early. But ultimately, the community, community rallied around and put an end to this innovation project, pointing to the fact that the vast majority of these agencies actually did not have a good track record when it came to supporting the well-being of young people. They, they pointed in particular to the data that would be used as the input for this project, to the different attendance records, whether family members had been involved with, child, with the criminal justice system, child protective services. So all of the input data actually were drawn from agencies and institutions that have routinely harm, surveil, and mistreat young people. So why should the community expect a different outcome, a good outcome? And so again, it's harder to think about this critically in light of um, the questions of eugenics and how this supports the ranking and the rating of, of different groups. And so as a starting point to think critically about our present moment, our do-gooding efforts, I wanna suggest that when it comes to computational depth, deep learning, machine learning, without historical and sociological depth, what we're actually producing is superficial learning. We really have to situate our questions and our designs and our goals in a much deeper historical and social context so that we don't unwittingly reproduce racial inequalities um, and social inequities. And so let's apply this insight just for a moment to a particular setting. Let's look at it in the context of healthcare. Again, there's, there's mounds of, of research that really shows the various ways in which racial discrimination operates in our healthcare system. And it's not simply at the structural level, although that's important, that is at the level of policies and laws, but also interpersonally in terms of the way that healthcare uh, professionals treat different patients. And one set of, uh, a part of this literature is looking at how doctors routinely underestimate the pain of black patients um, and don't prescribe them the necessary treatments and medication that they might need. So a question for us would be, you know, what would it look like to actually outsource these decisions to AI? Would that make it more fair, more equitable? Would that be a way to bypass the existing social biases and forms of discrimination in our healthcare system. And so my recent work has been wrestling with this and similar questions in which I describe the combination of coded bias and imagined objectivity as the new gym code, innovation that enables social containment while appearing fairer than discriminatory practices of a previous era. What I'm drawing attention to with this concept is that technology can actually hide the ongoing nature of social domination and allow it to penetrate every facet of our lives under the guise of progress. And what I'm encouraging us to think about is how anti-Blackness gets encoded in and exercised through automated systems by offering four conceptual offspring to the new Jim Code that fall along kind of spectrum from the most obvious variety engineered inequity to the most insidious techno benevolence. And for the sake of time, I'm just gonna sketch the last element of this techno benevolence um, and then move towards some concluding thoughts. So techno benevolence refers to those technologies that aim to address bias in various ways. Take for example, new AI techniques for vetting job applicants. A company called HireVue aims to, quote, reduce unconscious bias and promote diversity in the workplace by using an AI-powered program that analyzes recorded interviews of prospective employees. So it uses thousands of data points, including verbal and nonverbal cues like facial expression, posture, vocal tone. And then it compares job seeker scores to those of existing top performing employees to decide who to flag as a desirable hire and who to reject. Uh, a, another value added, according to HireVue, is that there's a lot that a human interviewer misses that AI can keep track of to make, quote, data-driven talent decisions. After all, the problem of employment discrimination is widespread and well-documented. So the logic goes, wouldn't this be even more reason to outsource decisions to AI? Well, consider that question in light of a study by a Princeton team of computer scientists that examined whether 
A popular algorithm trained on human writing online exhibited the same racially biased tendencies that psychologists have documented among humans. In particular, they found that the algorithm associated white sounding names with pleasant words and black sounding names with unpleasant ones, which builds on a classic audit study from about 2003 in which two University of Chicago economists sent out thousands of resumes to employers in Boston and Chicago and just changed the names on the resumes. Some had names like Emily and Greg, some names like Lakeisha and Jamal. And what they found was that the white sounding names received 50% more callbacks. And so simply turning to technology to solve that form of employment bias is not going to save us. So too with gender coded words and names as Amazon learned a few years ago when its own hiring algorithm was found discriminating against women. Nevertheless, it should be clear why technical fixes that claim to bypass human biases are so desirable. If only there was a way to slay centuries of racist and sexist demons with a social justice bot, beyond desirable, more like magical. Magical for employers perhaps looking to streamline the grueling work of recruitment, but a curse for many job seekers. As this headline puts it, your next interview could be with a racist bot, bringing us back to that problem space we started with. So it's, it's worth noting that some job seekers are already developing ways to subvert the system by trading answers to employers' tests and creating fake applications as informal audits of their own. In terms of public policy, the Algorithmic Accountability Bill is one effort in the U.S. to create some protections around the ubiquity of automated and AI-based decisions in our everyday lives. It's a start, but in no way sufficient. Another development that keeps me somewhat hopeful is that tech workers themselves have increasingly been speaking out against the most egregious forms of corporate collusion with state-sanctioned racism. For example, Microsoft employees opposed to the company's ICE contract stated that as the people who build the technologies that Microsoft profits from, we refuse to be complicit. And in just the last few months, the Alphabet Workers Union has been gaining momentum. And so for anyone in the tech industry listening here, I would encourage you to look up these efforts and stay connected. And as this article published by Science for the People reminds us, contrary to popular narratives, organizing among technical workers has a vibrant history, including engineers and technicians in the 60s and 70s who fought professionalism, individualism, and reformism to contribute to radical labor organizing. The current tech workers movement, which includes students across our many institutions, can draw from these past organizers' strategies and challenges in learning to navigate the contradictions and complexities of organizing in tech today. In terms of education, which I think of as the ground zero for planting a more historically and socially situated approach to STEM, I'll just mention one concrete resource that you can download called the Advancing Racial Literacy in, St in, in Tech Handbook, which was developed by some wonderful colleagues at the Data and Society Research Institute in New York. The aim of this intervention is threefold, to develop an intellectual understanding of how structural racism operates in algorithms, social media platforms, and technologies not yet developed, and emotional intelligence concerning how to resolve racially stressful situations within organizations, and a commitment to take action to reduce harms to communities of color. In that spirit, initiatives like Data for Black Lives and the Detroit Community Tech Project are just two of the many different tech justice organizations that exist all over the world. Data for Black Lives brings together people working across a number of agencies and organizations in a proactive approach to tech justice, especially at the policy level. And the Detroit Community Technology Project develops and uses technology rooted in community needs, offering support to grassroots networks, doing data justice research, including hosting what they call discotechs, which stands for discovering technology which are these multimedia mobile neighborhood workshop fairs that can be adapted in other locales. 
in the end, it boils down to whose knowledge, or we might say whose intelligence we're enfolding into our so socio-technical systems. Who are we listening to? Returning to the issue of medical racism, it turns out if AI is trained on doctor's reports, it will draw discriminatory and faulty conclusions. According to the researchers, we didn't train the algorithm to predict what the doctor was going to say about the x-ray. We trained it to predict what the patient was going to say about their own experience of pain in the knee. And the, these predictions from the patient's reports were actually much more accurate. Who would have guessed? So here's my final proposition. If it is the case that inequity and injustice is woven into the very fabric of our society, then that means each twist, coil, and code is a chance for us to weave new patterns, practices, and politics. The vastness of the problems that we're up against will be their undoing once we accept that we are pattern makers. And so if, as I suggested at the start, an ahistoric and asocial approach to science and technology captures and contains, that means a historically and socially grounded approach can open up possibilities and pathways. It can create new settings and code new values and build on critical intellectual traditions that have continuously developed insights and strategies grounded in justice. And my hope is that we all find ways to build on this tradition. Thank you for your attention. So thank you so much, Ruha, for the fascinating and uh, incisive talk. And one of the things I was struck by was the way that you describe you know, the kind of uh, benevolence, you know, the kind of so-called benevolence uh, approach that people might bring to these uh, you know, to these communities, you know, as if a kind of a savior model in uh, particular ways. You know, so I wonder if you if you could look at the other side and and say a bit more about what you see as uh, community projects that have been successful that are emerging from within communities. And you know, this is what one of my students has called critical community technologies. And what are the conditions under which you've seen such such groups uh, flourish, where they have been the ones leveraging these technologies? Yeah, thank you so much, Fox. And thanks to all the organizers behind the screen um, helping us to convene in this uh, space and this conversation. And so, you know, there's there's different ways that this is taking shape. And I and I think that uh, there's no one set of conditions or requirements that I think can make technology more empowering, less oppressive. Um, the ones that I find fascinating is when the, these digital tools are turned back on those who wield power and who monopolize resources. Um, sometimes in longer versions of the talk, I'll, I'll mention uh, a, a parody example called the white collar early warning system, which is not community based, but it's an artist, a creative sort of rendering of what it means to take these tools that are typically targeting um, you know, mo the most disenfranchised communities and turn it back to those who produce risk for those very same populations. And so there's examples like that kind of subversive turning of the digital tools that sometimes uh, enroll or collaborate with communities to make happen. Then there are the examples that I hinted at, like the Detroit Community Technology Project. Um, there's a New York, there's a New York based uh, version of that in which, you know, it's really about generating meaningful questions as a starting point for any kind of design project. I think sometimes when we think about community collaboration, researchers, we huddle, we come up with something, and then we go out and try to find communities to collaborate with, rather than really starting at ground zero with the generation of questions. To me, that's where so much of the power is concentrated. The fact that people can't ask meaningful questions about their lives, about their world, and then have the resources to produce the data, produce the tools that would help them ask, answer and intervene in those issues. And so one of the places that I'm trying to work on that is at the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab here at Princeton, in which um, I have teams of undergrad students who partner with communities to generate questions and then the projects that come out of that as a 
as, um, to me, a, a, a better starting point. So rather than us think about, okay, this is what we want to do and then go find community partners. So the, the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab is one example housed in academia, but there are other you know, examples that come out of more policy or advocacy um, sort of orientation. There are uh, anti-surveillance types of, of projects, some that are more creative, um, in which people are creating fashion that are sort of anti-surveillance fashion examples versus like the LAPD uh, so, uh, coalition to stop um, uh, surveillance in Los Angeles and other places. So I think the take home is that this can take many, many different forms from uh, you know, on a continuum of more critical countering subversive to creative self-fashioning and you know community-based um, you know participatory research, whether that's in the context of environmental justice or data justice, um, there are so many examples. And so, for those who are looking to plug in, I would encourage them to visit the resources tab of my personal website, uhabenjamin.com/backslash/resources, and you'll see a really long list of places to plug in in your own backyard, and especially for the students who might be listening. You know, sometimes when we we are awakened to issues like this, we want to start our own thing, <laughs> you know, the kind of entrepreneurial spirit. And I would encourage us to plug into things that already exist as a starting point rather than jump the gun and try to try to come up the solutions going back to your savior, the idea of a savior complex. Uh, and so I, I hope that gives folks enough to chew on as a as a place to get started. Right. It, it does. It's so fascinating. And you bring to mind projects such as the Million Dollar Blocks Project, you know, looking at the amount of money, you know, mapping the amount of money used in communities to you know, for incarceration. It prompts people to think about other types of issues and where the money could have gone. You know, so that it, it just seems like exactly the kind of uh, literacy in reversing the lens that you describe. Uh, and uh, you know, so thank you. you know, thank you once again very much. And so next up, we have uh, John Kleinberg, professor at Cornell University, who's going to speak. And I think it's a very nice compliment to what we've just seen from uh, uh, Professor Ruha Benjamin, you know, because he's looking in some sense uh, under the hood, but at the same time, bringing that kind of uh, critical lens around issues of uh, fairness as well. So now let's uh, welcome uh, our uh, pre-recorded video by uh, John Kleinberg, followed again by a brief clarifying Q&A. It's a pleasure to be uh, able to take part in this event today. And I'll be talking about uh, topics in fairness and bias in algorithmic de decision making. And I'll, I'll be approaching this uh, as a, a computer scientist. But what I'll be talking about is uh, joint work with uh, my PhD student, Manish Raghavan, and then with uh, three researchers from uh, three other domains, from Jens Ludwig in uh, public policy, Sentil Mulanathan in behavioral economics, and Cass Sunstein, who's a professor of law. And in some sense, to frame what I'll be talking about, it's useful to actually go back to uh, a period of time when I was a, a PhD student at, at, at MIT in the mid 1990s. And th there was a lot of excitement at that moment about the way in which an idea that had been really ubiquitous in fields like human computer interaction uh, suddenly became mainstream through much of computer science. And that was the idea that the systems we were designing really had these two different axes that we had to think about. There was the technical axis along which we had always organized things, but then there was also a social dimension, right? Where we built systems and we needed to be sensitive to the social and economic forces uh, that underpinned them. In some genuine sense, that period through the 1990s when we saw the emergence of systems like the World Wide Web, um, it, we really saw the building of socio-technical systems. but. Over the past 10 years, particularly, we've been discovering that you know, these systems, uh, even when we take both of these into account, don't always produce the outcomes that we were hoping. They end up being awash in misinformation. They can lead to conflict and polarization. They can produce decisions that seem biased against particular groups of people. It's almost as though there's this third dimension that we haven't been taking into account and much of the momentum in the past 10 years of research at the interface of computing and the social sciences has really been trying to explore what this third dimension might look like. And if I were to summarize, I might say it's almost as though there's this 
normative dimension that we've been missing in the design of our systems. That even if we fully understand, which we certainly don't, the social and technical forces at play, it none even with all of that, it does not tell us uh, what outcomes we should be aiming for, right? What what we might want as a as a society. That in the end is a different question. And so I want to talk about, from the computer science perspective, how some of these issues have come into play in the algorithms, uh, the AI systems, and the uh, machine learning protocols that we have been trying to deploy. Much of this begins with a observation that people have been making that's gathered increasing amount of force in the past few years as well, which is to take ideas that we have been very good at uh, executing in the online world, things like ranking, things like recommendation, as in this, this help screen from a, a, a Netflix page, where we take people online and we, you know, with complex sets of tastes and interests, we produce feature vectors that represent them. And then we try and make a prediction. For example, the you know a prediction about whether they will like this particular movie. What is the probability they will like this movie? Um, and people began asking, if we're so good at doing this in the online world, uh, let's think about situations in the on in the offline world where there's something that looks syntactically similar going on, right? So let's think about something that superficially is quite different, which is the act of applying for a job. If we think about it, we take somebody with their complex past work experience, they produce a tabular feature-like representation in the form of a resume. They submit it to a human hiring committee that evaluates it, right? A very similar pipeline. And that committee then makes some kind of a, well, it's not clear what they do, right? They evaluate some objective function. Do they make a prediction? This is actually where it gets kind of complicated. And that, that tension is actually what I'll be trying to get at in, in my talk. A similar thing happens with the college admissions process. You take someone's grade nine through 12 educational history, their interests and so forth, turn it into a feature representation. And again, a committee might make a decision with an unclear objective function. So many things following this kind of template, right? Things that we might call screening decisions, right? So when somebody applies for a job, there has to be a, de a decision made. Um, educational admission decisions and many other domains, the, you know, applications for a loan in the domain of credit. Uh, even in the criminal justice system where the law instructs a judge uh, at a pretrial detention hearing to make a prediction about the, uh, the likelihood that a defendant will return for their court appearance uh, without committing uh, a crime in the meantime. And so these are all what you might call high stakes decisions. These are decisions where the outcome matters significantly to the individual being screened, right? So it matters a lot if you get this job you apply for, if you get into this college you apply for, and in all, all these other examples. This is not to say that ranking and recommendation of online content um, are somehow overall low stakes activities. We, you know, in the end, it certainly does not matter whether Netflix gets right, whether I like this movie. In the end, it doesn't matter whether this particular search results page has the result I was particularly looking for. But We've also seen over the past few years that you can take 100 billion of these low stakes decisions, right? Search results, newsfeed decisions, and they can add up to something that is extremely high stakes, like the formation of public opinion as part of the political process in a, in a, in a large country. So everything that we do in this domain, I think, has giant ramifications. The stakes are high. I sort of focus on these screening decisions as being individually high stakes. Each individual decision is actually significant. And because of this, it's very natural, and research has turned to this question of the risks of bias in these kinds of decisions, when we deploy algorithms to make them, or when we deploy groups of humans to make them. And so if we're gonna think about the ways in which algorithms uh, might introduce bias into this process, we should really start by thinking about what we know about human bias in these situations, because human bias is a profound factor in, in, in all, all of these domains. Now, well, there's been an extensive amount of research in the behavioral sciences on human biases, and including an explosion of work in the 1990s on topics in Im Im implicit bias. Um, and a number of now classical investigations looked at this question empirically, and they found things that are sort of illustrated by, for example, this uh, graph on the, on the right here, which I'll explain. This comes from a paper in Nature in 1997 by the uh, European social scientists, Christine Vannevoss and Agnes Vold, 
And so the, 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 they were interested in the disparate impact of screening decisions as, as we are here today. And so what they did was they got records of um, decisions that were made on European Research Commission grant proposals. And as part of that process, the reviewer of the proposal was supposed to assign a so-called competence score to the principal investigator. How competent are they to do the research? And so that, that's some kind of a numerical score. And Veneros and Fold were interested in this case in potential disparate impacts in the assignment of this competence score by, by uh, gender. Okay, and so what they did was they looked at many different measures of external impact for this researcher. They looked at publications, number of publications in high profile venues, citations of those publications, success at past European Research Commission grant proposals and so forth. And they put that on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, uh, they plotted the confidence score. And what we see here is that if I pick a particular point on the x-axis, a particular value of the external impact, and I start to move vertically, we see that the typical confidence score for principal investigators who were men was significantly higher than for women. Or if I particular, pick a particular point on the y-axis and I move horizontally, then what I find is that for a particular competence score, women as principal investigators needed significantly higher measures of external impact in order to achieve that. And this was one of many studies uh, around this time that tried this research methodology. Find people who are similar in the features that they are presenting to the decision and are nonetheless getting very different outcome and thereby discovering some of the ways in which this breaks down uh, al al along the lines of what the law considers to be protected attributes. So this is an illustration of human bias in an empirical context. Now, when we move to algorithms and we consider the idea of algorithms making similar decisions, that we might train an algorithm uh, to engage in a predictive activity to make a decision like this, um, we face a different sort of situation. First, algorithms, in contrast to humans, have no direct incentives to exhibit bias. That's essentially by definition. The algorithm, after all, knows really in the end nothing about the world. It doesn't know who you are. It's simply been trained to optimize the subjective function. Despite this, what we've learned in the past several years of research is that there are many sources of potential bias in algorithms. And we can try conceptually to decompose these into some constituent parts. So for example, the choice of label or objective function that I'm trying to predict, right? The target of my prediction. And we can see how this might happen. You know, suppose for example, that I were trying to train an algorithm to assign a competence score in evaluating European Research Commission grant proposals. I might feed it training data, uh, right? Just the administrative data of the administration of this program over many years, what scores were assigned to which grant proposals. In the process, it would learn to make these predictions and it might pick up on, therefore, the gender disparity that was already in the data, right? It's, it's simply trying to faithfully approximate the training data it's been given. Similarly, uh, we could see that in the uh, in the features which I handed, right? If I'm trying to have it predict other things, but one thing that I handed is the so-called competence score of the researcher, then it essentially has a feature that already has that bias built into it. These are the kinds of points uh, that we that we think about. Um, now, if we want to look at sources of bias in algorithms, then we face an interpretability challenge. We have to actually be able to look into the algorithm and try to understand what's 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 going on. But a first point I'd like to make is that interpretability is not only an issue for algorithms. In fact, much of discrimination law is actually built, if you think about it, uh, with the idea that human decision making is likewise inscrutable and uninterpretable. Because in the end, the law actually recognizes two categories of discrimination. This is in uh, U.S. discrimination law, where the terminology is disparate treatment versus disparate impact. Disparate treatment, deliberately favoring one applicant, say in, the, in our running example of something like hiring, um, based on a protected attribute like race, gender, national origin, religion, or age. And separately, disparate impact, the, the notion that regardless of intent, if a screening decision has a disproportionate adverse effect on a protected group, then the burden of proof shifts to the decision maker to establish the business necessity of their decision, right? Such that if I were hiring people for a job that regularly involved 
reaching things in ex extremely high places, then I might want employees who were taller, even if that has a disproportionate adverse effect based on gender, for example. But if I were hiring software engineers and I put in a height requirement, then it'd be very, very hard to justify that on grounds of business necessity. Now, the point is it can be very hard to tell if a decision maker has engaged in disparate treatment or in disparate impact. And there are a few reasons for this. The most immediate is that it's very hard to ask people. They might, they might lie. Uh, they might be deceptive in, in the evidence that they present. But there's also a deeper reason, a reason coming from the behavioral sciences, which is they might genuinely not know the rationale they used for their decision. Right. And so there's actually a long history of work in, in, the, in the behavioral sciences establishing that when people provide you with explanations for their decisions, um, those may or may not be accurate renditions of what actually went into their decision. How could we possibly know that? Well, some of this work goes back to a series of very creative experiments done by Nisbet and Wilson in the 1970s, where they would create lab situations, ask people to make decisions. And then with the second group, they would subtly change some feature of the environment, get the decision to change, and then ask people why they made their decision. And often people's explanations had nothing to do with the one feature of the environment that changed. That's kind of abstract. So let me make that very concrete with an example from one of their experiments. In one of their experiments, they gave people a word recall task. So they would, um, they would ask people to memorize a list of words, recite it back, and then at the end, they would ask a non sequitur question. Name a brand of laundry detergent. Okay. In group B, they would do the same thing. But in the word recall task, the words they would ask people uh, to memorize were things like beach, ocean, moon, waves, sea, and so forth. And then when they said name a brand of laundry detergent, many more people said tide. Now, this is the effect of priming, right? Priming is that if I tell you a bunch of words and then I ask you to think of a word, you often think of a word that's kind of right in the vicinity of all those words by the process of free association. Um, but Nisbet Wilson did one more step, which was extremely clever. They asked people, why did you pick that brand of laundry detergent? And in both groups A and B, both conditions of the experiment, people said it's because it's the one my family used when I was growing up, it's the one we use at home, I remember the logo from the store. People in the second group did not say it's because you primed me with a lot of words that made me think of Tide. Even though statistically, we know that many of those people must have been primed because there was a big difference in how many people said Tide in the two groups. So there are many other Nisbet Wilson experiments. In a different one, you ask people to choose clothes from a rack. You orient the rack to get them to choose the one on the right, uh, you know, with high probability. Yet when people are asked why they chose the article of clothing, they mention the style or the color and not the fact that you had oriented things to essentially force that one on them. In other words, what's essentially going on here is that it's a, a set of findings that sort of should make us think a little harder about, you know, the notion of interpretability and inscrutability as we often apply it to algorithms. Because it says, although people are always happy to give you the sense of an explanation, they're always happy to say, this is why I did something. The harder question is to know whether that explanation is correct, right? In some sense, humans in their own way are inscrutable, are black boxes in their decision-making. We can't always know why they did what they did. And that, we argue, actually presents an interesting opportunity. Right? Beyond the question of whether algorithms are increasing or decreasing the level of discrimination in a particular situation, which is an important question that the, the field has been thinking about, we argue there's a second question, which is the ways in which alg well-regulated algorithms can make discrimination uh, easier to detect. The point being that even an algorithm that's extremely complex, trained through an extremely long pipeline of training with very large amounts of training data, Despite all of that, it has certain properties that we can never expect from human decision makers, right? Obviously, um, you know, it's not that we can simply read the code and expect to understand the algorithm, right? There are all sorts of reasons ranging from the difficulty, the cognitive difficulty of reading code to formal results and undecidability that tell us that. But we can do some things you could never do with a human being. You can, for example, if the algorithm is available for inspection, uh, examine the objective function that's being optimized, right? Whereas with human decision makers, we can never really ask somebody, what is your objective function, right? Think of all the situations in which you've been called on to evaluate people. You would have a hard time writing down your formal objective function in that situation. We can provide the algorithm with counterfactuals. We, we, we can say, here's somebody who was evaluated. I'm going to change certain features and I'm going to run this through the classifier again and see if the result changes. 
again, with a human being, you, you could ask somebody, would you have made the same decision if this person had graduated from school X instead of school Y? And they might be, even in good faith, attempt to give you an answer to that question, but there's no way to really know if that's actually what they would have done. So the point is, algorithms aren't just a change in accuracy or scale or quantity relative to humans. They're doing something dramatically different. They have an explicit formal process that they're following with explicit features and explicit objective function, something that we can actually trace even if we can't follow the code. And so we can probe them uh, you know, almost as a natural experiment in ways that we could never do with human beings. And so in this final couple minutes of the talk, I wanted to ask what kinds of things might we learn if we can probe an algorithm in this way? And so I'll introduce a bit of notation to be able to talk about this, but it, it leads to the observation that this ways in which we can decompose algorithmic bias can actually be made formally in a certain sense. So how might we make this formal? Well, let's think about a machine learning pipeline. And again, let's think about the notion of a well-regulated algorithm, meaning that the features, the training process, and the objective function are available for inspection. That's clearly crucial in any of this analysis. So we have individuals, they have feature vectors. We have a something that the screener is trying to optimize. Let's call it a productivity function. Um, we're concerned about bias. So we have an advantage group, call it A, and a disadvantage group, let's call it D. And finally, uh, the frequency of different feature vectors in these populations are different, right? So the frequency of feature vector X in group A is some function P of XA, and in group D, it's P of XD. So the point might be that given the full feature vector X, it doesn't matter what group somebody comes from, the advantage group or the disadvantage group, um, because X contains everything we need to evaluate the productivity function. Nevertheless, there might be a disparity between these two groups because of the way those feature vectors are distributed, right? That A might have an abundance of feature vectors conferring high outcomes in the screening process, and D might have an abundance of feature vectors conferring lower outcomes, right? So in particular, we could compute the average value of F in both group A and group D. Let's call that VA of F and VD of F. And we could look at now uh, what sociologists might call the structural disadvantage. Namely, D of F is now the difference in averages. It's the difference between the average value in A and the average value in D, right? Now, this is something which pre precedes the introduction of the algorithm. This was already present in society. And so while we might want to use the algorithm to remediate that, it's important to realize that that is um, something that predates the algorithm. It's not a case, not a question about what the algorithm has added to the process. Now the algorithm will morph this function. And so for any function, not just F, um, we might end up being interested in disparity. Let's call that D of W, right? So the difference in averages for any function W. Now let's think about the ways in which um, the algorithm changes this function as it goes, right? So first of all, the algorithm designer is gonna use a function G instead of F, right? Because the real F is not accessible to them. So they're gonna use an approximation. Second, the full feature vector X is not accessible to them. So they're going to use um, R and R of X instead of the full X. And finally, because R of X is much shorter than X, they're going to use a transformed objective, some shortened function H composed with R instead of G. And finally, there's gonna be a training procedure that produces a function T instead of H. So at the beginning, we had D of F, the structural disadvantage. But at the end of this pipeline, we have D of T composed with R, the trained function on the reduced representation. And now the final point is that we actually see that we can take this disparity, the disparity in T composed with R produced by the machine learning algorithm, and break it into these four components, the structural disadvantage that preceded uh, the, the algorithm's introduction, followed by the bias from the choice of outcome, G instead of F, the bias from the choice of features, reduce representation R of X instead of X, and finally the bias from the training procedure, T instead of the true approximate function H, okay? And so it actually says we can, once we have access to the pipeline, we can actually do this decomposition. And with that, I wanted to wrap up. Again, algorithms are presenting us with an interesting uh, uh, opportunity, right? Human decision-making contains bias, as we've seen algorithmic decision-making contains bias, but there's a certain kind of detectability of bias and algorithmic decision-making that's really unprecedented if we compare it to human decision-making. They contain explicit ingredients that allow us to attribute components of the decision 
to aspects of the screening process. This will only happen with regulations in place that allow us to examine the machine learning pipeline. But with that in place, it really creates very interesting opportunities going forward and one in which many fields are going to have to play a part. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, John, for the really insightful talk. And, uh, yeah, and one of the things that struck me was just the parallel use of the term uh, you know, socio-technical gap you know, from the intro and, of course, from your talk here. And one of the things I love about your work is that you're looking deeply at the socio, at the social side, as well as you know, investigating particular formalisms that can be deployed to either explain or implement uh, systems. And so following that line, one question that I have relating to your work is uh, in, in your paper on algorithmic fairness you know, that uh, relates to a lot of the topics you spoke about, you know, I was really struck by you know, your, you know, your central argument, which is that the strategy of blinding you know, algorithm, you know, the, an algorithm's race inadvertently detracts from fairness. And what that really reminded me on the social side is of uh, Eduardo Bonilla Silva's work on uh, colorblind racism, in which he describes certain kind of frameworks that relate to colorblind ideology and how it not only detracts from fairness, but actually discriminates. You know, so for him, that's abstract liberalism, naturalizing racist outcomes like redlining, cultural racism, minimizing of racism. And so I just wonder if you could help to build a bridge from your, you know, your comments you know, and your insights about the limitations of blinding algorithms to race and, uh, you know, and the notion of uh, colorblind racism you know, and, and, and the way that that might actually implement particular types of discrimination. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for that question. And uh, I think it's the kind of question that I, I certainly, you know, look, look forward to um, hearing the other panelists thoughts on as well, because I think this, you know, I definitely appreciate being in this kind of a conversation, you know, with uh, so many perspectives represented. I think as a right, I, I think from the, the computer science side, I think we, you know, we always need to be careful about, um, you know, the ways in which, uh, right, these, you know, these issues of bias, for example, come in through things that we construct that we often, you know, think of as part of the given statement of the question, you know, so I, I thought, I thought your example at the very beginning of the session on recommender systems, you know, sort of is one one example of this, I think any any time that we we set up a ranking of people or a clustering of people, we have to choose some kind of objective. What does it mean for people to be similar? You know, and, and we often say we start from this similarity metric, and then we we put a lot of work into the clustering or the ranking. But of course, you know, obviously a sort of huge and and often you know untold number of unstated assumptions went into the construction of that objective function that that we take as um, as given in, in the statement of, of, of the question. And, and so, so I think that's one dimension of the gap, you know, that I think you're, you know, I, I think that, that we're all thinking about that there's been this territory that somehow I think each side of the discussion, you know, has sometimes assumed that perhaps the other one was somehow trying to get under control and in fact wasn't that, you know, the, on the computer science side, we'll sometimes take the problem formulation as a given, you know, at some low level, and then we'll work very hard on sort of extending it from there. But of course, a lot of that represented choices that um, you know uh, that I think uh, incorporate the bias. I think the same thing happens again. Sort of thinking about the the connection of some of the things you were saying in the construction of features. All of these systems, you know, no system is dealing with the person. You know, every algorithmic system is dealing with the representation, and and so I think the choice of encodings and the choice of representation, which is again I think very much in the theme of um, some of the events going on here, is 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 again something that often, you know, in the in the modeling of the problem, people take that as given. They say, "I'm going to start from the fact that you've represented individuals, you've represented applicants, you've represented users, you've represented readers of the news, all of these things using a certain uh, collection of features or at least some kind of formalism, and then I'll do the best I can from there." And so I think, you know, a lot of the question is to actually ask, "Where did that representation come from? What does that encode?" I think it's, it's uh, I think it's just such a fascinating area, and uh, we don't have a lot of time before we go to you know, to our next uh, speaker. You know, but maybe just uh, as planting food for thought for later, I feel like one of the one of the central dialogues we can 
you know, you know, points of dialogue we can have within this panel is about the essential assumptions within each field. And uh, sometimes there is a sense, you know, you know, so I'm coming from computer science uh, myself uh, as, as well. And there can be a sense that if you're using algorithmic or formalist approaches, then you're taking a reductionistic pro approach to society. And I think what your work shows is that you can use formalisms to address subjective issues in ways that really provide you know, additional insight you know, that can be useful for those subjective social issues as well. So I hope we can pick up the point about the role of uh, formalization and how it's not always reductive in work such as Norris Later. Thanks, and, and, uh, I'm so next, looking forward to that. Thanks so much. And uh, so next up, you know, we have uh, Benaz Farahi, who will speak from a different perspective and uh, begin to, you know, and, and her reported talk will provide insights from an artistic point of view, you know, you know, bringing together our trifecta of sociology, computer science, and the arts, and in particular, looking at reflective and interpretive issues around uh, such, uh, uh, around these issues of bias in AI. So let's begin uh, uh, Benaz's uh, presentation. where we are immersed in the world of machine learning algorithms, computer vision, and biometric sensors. But what does this all mean? Might these computational systems not replicate somewhat disturbingly our underlying biases and serve to reinforce the marginalization of those who have typically been excluded? Is AI necessarily complicit in replicating human prejudice? Or are there ways of deploying AI as a means of exposing human bias? I would suggest that there are potential strategies that could be deployed for AI to actually overcome bias. In this presentation, I'm going to address notions of the gaze, surveillance, and ways of seeing through the lens of my own creative practice. By implementing computer vision technologies, I hope to examine how different strategies of the gaze can be seen to undermine various forms of power structure and to promote forms of resistance. Here I'm trying to avoid any form of technological determinism. Rather than rehashing arguments as to whether surveillance is good or bad, I hope to take an intersectional feminist approach to show what constitute the gaze and surveillance and to consider what the strategies of resistance might be proved to be effective in art and design practices. In my work, I have used various computer vision technologies to enhance human perception. For example, this is an emotive wearable which can recognize and respond to the facial expressions of people around with different type of behaviors. This type of smart, soft robotic garment could potentially benefit those with autism who have difficulties recognizing facial expressions. is an emotive collar equipped with a facial tracking camera and an array of rotating quills 
which respond to the movement of onlookers and their facial expressions. Similar to how a blind person could sense through haptic information, the movement of the wearable would allow the wearer to sense where people are standing and the emotions they're expressing, even with their eyes closed. two questions related to the notion of the gaze. Firstly, what does it mean to be observed? Secondly, what do we see when we look out at the world? Through my argument, I use gaze as an interchangeable concept which could be shared between human and machine. This takes us to the historical concept of panopticon. The panopticon refers to a type of institutional building and a system of control envisioned by English philosopher Jeremy Bentham in 18th century. The layout of the panopticon allows a guard to observe occupants without them knowing whether or not they're being watched. French philosopher Michel Foucault revitalizes interest in the panopticon in his 1975 book, Discipline and Punish, and uses it to illustrate such a model could be applied to disciplinary societies in order to control their citizens. He described the prisoner of a panopticon as being at the receiving end of asymmetrical surveillance. As a consequence, the inmate polices himself for fear of punishment. What is fascinating about this example is that um, rather than external actions, the gaze of the watcher is internalized to such an extent that each prisoner become his or her own watch person. Similarly, we could argue that um, this is what allows rules and regulation to be internalized so as to inform our actions, behaviors, and even our beliefs. Moreover, the manner in which we naturalize and internalize rules, it could be claimed causes society to be less willing to contest unjust laws and accept a dominant outlook. Similar to how the inmates are not aware whether or not they're being watched, we are not aware that we have been controlled through naturalized dominant rules rooted in our own culture. This internalized asymmetrical power structure could be seen in the notion of male gaze. In her essay on visual pleasure and narrative cinema, Laura Mulvey exposes the asymmetry of social and political power relations between men and women. Mulvey claims that the male gaze serves to depict women as the object of pleasure for the heterosexual male viewer. Besides the fact that women are regularly subject to sexual harassment whenever they enter public space through various forms of looked atness, women have absorbed all this unconsciously as a form of internalized male gaze. What if women were to subvert this through the power of their gaze? we draw up in computer vision technologies to allow women to know when onlookers are staring at them? Augmented with facial and gaze tracking technology and smart materials, this cape responds to the onlooker's gaze. The project engages with broader social issues such as the male gaze on the female body. The facial tracking algorithm in this piece detects age, gender, and gaze of the onlooker. While we know that gender is performative and it doesn't depend on pure representation, the movement of the garment based on the viewer's gaze could unfold in new sets of social meanings. If you are the wearer, you know which part of your body is being looked at, and if you are an onlooker, you know that your action is being noticed. The aim is to see how different strategies could be used to undermine the patriarchal system 
by developing a form of resistance using surveillance technology. I wonder what do we see as we gaze out to the world? As a thought experiment, French psychoanalysis Jacques Lacan invites us to envision ourselves before a female mantis. The female mantis is known for devouring its partner after sex. In Lacan's experiments, we are wearing a mask and we do not know whether the mask represents us as a female or male. And therefore, we don't know whether or not we will be eaten by the female mantis. We simply do not know what we are to the other, and we often project our own very biases to the other in order to understand the other. In fact, we don't see anyone as they are, rather we see them as we are. And how we are is informed by the conformity to many of behavioral assumptions dictated by laws and customs. Although the colonial, racist, and sexist gaze might project oppression, backwardness, and terrorism onto the image of Muslim women wearing a borcha, I would like to stress the inherent difference between a mask and masquerade. While the mask hides, the masquerade reveals. But perhaps we could suggest that both are acting to some extent as a shield against the intrusive gaze. This project is inspired by the historical mask worn by Bandari women from southern Iran. It has been said that these masks were developed during Portuguese colonial rule as a way of protecting the wearer from the gaze of a slave master looking for pretty women. From these Iranian masks protecting women from the patriarchal oppression to masks of northwest coast Indians, to masks worn as political statements, masks take on a range of different religious, social and political roles and offer an interesting insight into how we could use them to either conceal or reveal our identities. While these Iranian masks cover most of the wearer's face except the eye, I've been wondering how the eyes could be used as an expressive medium for communication. In my research, I came across an interesting incident in which an American officer uses blinking to send a secret message. In this video, you're seeing Admiral Jeremy Denton blinking the word torture using Morse code during his captivity in Vietnam. Well, I don't know what uh, is happening. But uh, whatever the position of my government is, I support it fully. Mm -hmm. Whatever the position of my government is, I believe in it. Yes, sir. I am a member of that government. The use of code for communication is nothing new. And in fact, women came up with a code word as a method for reporting domestic abuse during this lockdown. In this project, I was particularly inspired by a recent experiment involving two AI bots at the Facebook AI lab. The intention was to monitor how two bots might develop a dialogue. However, during this experiment, the bots seemingly started to formulate their own language, a language that no human could understand. The researchers um, had to intervene and tweak the algorithms to prevent this from happening. The story could also reveal how knowledge is power and inability to understand unnerves those who wish to maintain their authority. For the source text of this project, I used the seminal article Can the Subaltern Speak? by the feminist theorist Gayatri Spivak. She asked whether it might be possible for the colonized or the subaltern 
to have a voice in the face of colonial oppression. Using machine learning algorithm, we can use Markov chain to create a text. We represent each word as, as a state and view transitions as the likelihood that a specific word might go after another. We can consider these states at either a word or character level. And we can analyze what the probability might be of a given letter appearing after three letters. The engrams of a given text provides a strategy for generating the next text. The Markov chain could be therefore used to generate text where each new letter is dependent upon the previous letters. As the mass communicates using BLE protocol, the algorithm um, is repeated and the engrams changes. The smaller the engram gets, the less meaning there is in, in the generated text from the linguistic perspective. Each letter generated through this process is translated into Morse code, which informs the movement of the actuators. In the video documentation of this project, which will be shown shortly, you will see two women wearing masks covered with eyelashes controlled by AI. They begin to communicate with each other, blinking their eyelashes in rapid succession. The aim is to develop a secret message for transmitting information between multiple women. The project brings together design, critical thinking, feminism, and AI. Vincent Churchill once said, we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. But doesn't this suggest a form of technological determinism? After all, there is no inherent application for any tool. A knife could be used as a murder weapon or just as a tool for cutting an apple. Similar arguments could be made about surveillance. The question we should ask are, in what context, how and for whom are we using it? We should be aware of potential problems with AI. For once an issue is recognized as problem, it becomes a different kind of problem. It becomes a problem not by which we are trapped, but rather with which we can deal. Bias is certainly a problem which originates from human beings and is replicated and even exacerbated in AI. As we are training the artificial algorithms to learn to see the world, it is important to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be seen by the machine? And through the lens of what kind of data are they trained to look out to the world? So thanks so much, Benaz, for the fascinating, creative and evocative talk. And uh, one of the things that your talk brought to mind for me was that you're looking both at issues that are implemented and instantiated by the machine, you know, so the gaze of the machine, you know, the really you know, surveillance technologies and so forth, as well as the kind of human phenomena that, uh, you know, that, that you're discussing and putting into dialogue with critical theory and the arts. And so I was struck by one phrase early on in your talk where you, you know, mentioned about uh, resistive strategies against these kind of 
issues, whether it's a, a kind of objectifying gaze or other forms of discriminatory surveillance. And so you mentioned that certain resi resistive strategies can be uh, proved to be effective in art and design practices. And so I wonder just for you, what, what does it mean for a resistive strategy to be proved effective in art and design practice? Um, thank you so much for the great question, Fox. And also, before I answer, I want to say that it's a great honor to be in such an inspiring uh, lineup of speakers. I'm honored to be here. Um, to answer your question, I think, um, yeah, like, uh, especially from art and design perspective, um, I'm per particularly interested in ways that we can use various computational systems and repurpose those in order to bring a new sort of insights or in a way kind of subvert um, certain dominant assumptions that we have either through our culture or through uh, sort of um, technological assumptions that we have. Um, so it's always this sort of having um, a, a hand on the technology and, and um, um, in order to subvert it in a way. Um, in particular, I would say I'm really inspired also by the work of other artists such as Christopho Divsko and his notion of interrogative design in which we really look at design as a way of addressing larger social, political, cultural issues. Um, so in my case, particularly, I'm interested to use a lot of computer vision technologies embedded in the substrate of the matter and see that how materials could be intelligent and smart enough but also to address larger issues in order to empower those that, for instance, um, in the latest project, uh, the women that they were oppressed or um, uh, sort of, um, uh, yeah, oppressed under colonial um, oppression, how we can empower those uh, through the use of technology. Uh, so it's always sort of uh, bringing uh, technology and repurposing it um, uh, and give it a certain twist for um, sort of envisioning what that future would look like. Yeah, th thanks so much for the elaboration. And maybe if we continue down the same path, you know, there you know, in the in the same phrase, you know, there is the particular word of uh, prove. And so, you know, for so, for a researcher such as John, a proof has a very particular kind of set of you know, a very particular kind of meaning. And uh, a researcher such as Ruha might use a, you know, a, a term such as uh, demonstrate, depending on the kind of work that she is is doing. And so, in work where you're building evocative objects, you know, maybe to to spark critical reflection, does prove mean something kind of like you can demonstrate that people think critically after engaging with this work, or you know, is there some you know, something else that you're aiming for? So again, what is it? You know, in in some sense, what does it mean? to uh, prove within the domain in which you operate? I think a lot of time, perhaps, it's bringing a new type of questions. So it's bringing a new sort of uh, what if questions. What if women um, were able to uh, experience the gaze of other on their body as they're entering the public space? I think um, uh, bringing this type of provocative questions and creating conversations and sort of sharing this word with others, um, it creates sort of, uh, I would say, um, a, an escape or a sort of imagination for how we can really sort of reuse or repurpose these technologies in a novel way that reflect on critical issues, on issues related either to feminism or critical studies. And I'm really interested to see how, how the world of design and art could learn from those disciplines and sort of combine and merge them together in order to empower um, uh, the, the sort of um, uh, those communities. Yeah, thanks, I really love this idea you know, that, you know, that we're describing the role of the arts not to answer questions, you know, but to provoke questions. And through those questions, people can better understand the operations of these kind of systems that impose bias. And to provoke those kind of questions, then imagination, aesthetics, you know, culture, subjectivity, all of those kind of issues within the, the the realm of the work that you're doing become crucial for that kind of practice. You know, so I really appreciate the kind of insights that you've uh, brought, and uh, it's also a kind of segue because 
now we have all of the panelists uh, together and some time to engage in uh, questions as a, uh, as, as a group. And uh, so I would like just to begin to transition into you know, those, those questions and maybe pick up with one that came up uh, uh, earlier you know, in my question with John, and he mentioned maybe that would be a great thing to talk about as a panel. And what the observation was, you know, it was this idea that you know, in uh, John's work, you know, he's showing that a particular type of uh, system, you know, you know, if, you know, if you, you know, in that case, you know, blind the algorithm to race, but if you blind it to any particular kind of social issue that relates to discrimination, then you could inadvertently detract from fairness. And then the other thing that I mentioned was that in, in the social sciences, there's the idea of colorblind racism, which seems to have a very strong parallel to this, you know, to this kind of algorithmic insight. And so maybe to begin, I could ask uh, Ruha the same question. You know, so what, you know, what is your take on reconciling this idea that uh, computationally blinding algorithms from race detracts from fairness, and then socially color blindness you know, you know, also detracts from fairness or even more you know, encodes uh, uh, racism? You know, so can you just elaborate on what you see coming from that connection? Yeah, can you rethink the question a bit? It's it's a little hard for me to uh, get at what you're, sure, what I'd, you're... Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. Yeah, so it's really just reconciling, I think, a similar insight coming from two points of uh, view. And so in computer science, the idea is that when you look at fairness through the lens of uh, estimation approaches, objective function functions, even formal definitions within that within that domain, then uh, John has found that blinding an algorithm to race detracts from fairness. And I know that that's also an idea within uh, sociology from another perspective. You know, the idea that color blindness, you know, that is blinding you know, or, or you know, you know, ignoring the role of race also detracts from fairness. And so I'd ask if you could elaborate on that from uh, your lens. Uh, as well, you know, the kind of role of uh, obscuring an issue such as uh, race, you know, and the way that that can uh, yeah, end up uh, detracting from fairness. Yeah, I, I certainly can. Um, so it is true, and you, you know, you cited uh, Bonilla Silva and others where, you know, it just comes down to this faulty notion that, you know, ignoring something makes it go away. And really, it's just a way of uh, delaying thought or action around it. Now, something I want to put in conversation with this idea of colorblind racism is that paying attention to things, collecting data on issues that oftentimes we, and moving away from ignoring, um, assume that simply producing knowledge or highlighting or exposing certain issues through the use of data and various tools is itself a solution. And an idea that I write a little bit about in Race After Technology is this notion of the datafication of injustice. That is to say that we are often asking questions about issues that we, we should or we could already sort of have the answers to. That is to say, we're producing more and more data and knowledge about problems that we know exist, in some cases that we know how to tackle and that there's not the social and political will to deal with. And so I wanna put on the table this idea that yes, ignoring, let's say racism and other forms of inequality, it certainly stands in the way of social change and transformation, but sometimes too, the the call for more and more data uh, and exposure of issues can also be a delaying tactic to acting on what we already know. And so that's a different way of complicating the notion of paying attention to issues is not a straightforward solution. It can actually stand in the way of making change as well. Uh, thanks so much for the, for the point. And I saw, uh, John nodding as you speak. Yeah, so could you maybe also respond to Ruha's uh, notion you know, that sometimes data collection or even uh, big data can, could be seen as a stalling tactic or, or even just, uh, you know, even if not in, intentionally could have that kind of effect. And then 
also you know, maybe relate your notion of uh, algorithmic fairness you know, you know, to the kind of uh, sociological notion of that you know, that uh, Rupa has just uh, described. Sure. Yeah. And no, I think thanks for that, those those points and thanks Rupa for the yeah. I think that's a, those are very uh, important things to keep in mind that there is this this kind of continuum where um, you know obviously not paying attention to things uh, you know poses these problems, but that there can be a point where we have um, essentially what you said, like we've, we've, we've collected data, we're aware of the problem and what, what we need next is not more data collection or more intensive uh, analysis of that. Um, I mean, a, a couple of things that seem interesting here is one, one the level of, of, of scale. So there's collecting data about the aggregate nature of the problem uh, that we recognize there's a, a policy change that needs to be made. We have ample evidence for that. And then there's sort of collecting nature about the individual uh, problem in a particular instance, right? So, for example, if a person believes that their particular workplace, uh, you know, is engaging in discriminatory behavior, even if we have enormous data about the aggregate effects of discrimination, we may not have much data about, you know, the effect in their particular um, place of work. That's a situation where, as these as these systems become more quantitative, we have the potential to turn the argument from one that might have been present four decades ago, where it now comes down to a sort of qualitative estimation of what the what the environment there was, what the decision making was, where we may have much more de detailed traces at the level of the individual. Now, detailed traces at the level of the individual, I think it's been interesting in all, all three of the, the talks that we saw, that there's this interesting tension that it, you know, it brings up both concerns as we collect this information, but it can also be used um, as a, you know, a source of power for someone who potentially is affected by these. And I, I was certainly very interested in sort of the relation um, in, 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 in the, the third talk about, you know, some of the ways in which these, these technologies can be used on, on both sides of it. So I think the aggregate versus the individual is interesting. Um, I also think it's, it's a very interesting point about um, the sort of collecting more data can be a stalling tactic because it's a, interesting, I think, how widespread uh, that certainly can be in computer science. So if we choose areas, uh, you know, and of course, I don't want to say, even if we choose quite different areas within computer science, and, you know, I don't want to say anything that would be, you know, controversial for my uh, colleagues in cryptography and security, but I, I think one one tension that comes up there in a, in a very different context is that there are systems that we know are insecure, and there comes a point where people say, we don't more attacks on these systems to demonstrate their insecurity. What we need is a more principled way of building them. You know, and so I think often what we have is the sort of collection, the enumeration of problems at some point needs to, to give way to the articulation of more principled solutions. All right, thanks so much. And yeah, you know, what you, know, you, you meant, you know, so John mentioned in his uh, talk about the role of uh, policy in terms of solutions. And then uh, Ruha just mentioned the kind of issue of uh, you know, that there are some of these kind of questions around bias in which there's an immense amount of wisdom and strategizing and history already. And so the next question is uh, for Binaz, you know, which is what, is, what do you see as the role of art and design then you know, for, you know, for maybe influencing policy makers or for instantiating some of the kind of, you know, some of the kind of practices that we already know well from uh, other uh, other domains. How can art and design play uh, you know, play a role in these kind of processes? Yeah, I think um, uh, it's a great question. And like um, in terms of like, I think um, developments of some sort of ethical guidelines would be obviously one way to start, but also I really think, especially for art and design, I think one of the important aspects of that is education. What I'm extremely excited about is to teach next generation of designers to be able to not look at the systems as sort of black box that they have no clue how it works, but they actually understand how it works, how they can train their own data sets how they can understand AI system as something that they can tinker and prototype and um, uh, repurpose them and, and don't wait for sort of big, large corporates to sort of dictate what is the future of technology, but we actually take active role in participating in shaping the conversation around the technology. So that's what I think that I really hope that the, in general um, we see in education a system in art and design uh, particularly to really um, the notion of literacy 
um, coming from um, Iran and knowing that sometimes it can be difficult to have access to knowledge and, and education or limited access. I think it's very important to open these borders and open the knowledge and share knowledge as much as possible. If people know how AI system, how computer vision technology works and they start tinkering with these technologies, that would empower them and would empower and open up new possibilities for the world of art and design. So I'm extremely excited about that possibility. All right, thanks so much. And, and one of the things that you mentioned in your, in, in your talk and the Q&A afterwards was the role of the imagination. And so what you bring to mind are works such as uh, Octavia Butler's Kindred, Joanna Russ's The Female Man, or Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. You know, so works that you could say from one lens are all within speculative, the, the domain of speculative fiction, but I actually think are some of the great uh, sociological <laughs> treatises of our time in the last uh, century, precisely because they can evoke and change minds through metaphor and other types of uh, interpretive means, not only you know, through, through uh, uh, say, quantitative uh, or qualitative studies even. So the next question will be one that comes from the audience. And, uh, and let's say, I think this one will go to John. It, it's, is it possible to find or create truly unbiased data and uh, if not, how do we avoid imbuing any data with our own implicit biases? Um, yeah, obviously a, a great question. And I don't think that it's one that there's a, a simple answer to. But I mean, I think if you were going to you know, make the argument that there really is no such thing as unbiased data, I think you would, you know, you would start from the observation that you know, it's in the nature of computation to work in, inside an abstraction. I mean, I think that's you know, that's both the sort of power and the, the limitation of the, of the computational approach, right? As computer scientists, we're taught to create abstraction barriers, um, you know, between the world, which is very complicated, and the system, you know, that we're building, the system that we're working in. Um, and so I think the, you know, and that, again, gives, gives computer science, I, I think abstraction barriers give technological systems much of their power. There are many examples of this, right? The fact that you can in non-pandemic times, perhaps fly into an airport, rent a car, and start driving that car down the highway, a, you know, a dangerous, potentially life-threatening activity. It's a car you've never seen before. You have no idea how the engine works, but because it presents to you the abstraction of a steering wheel, a gas pedal, and a brake pedal, you're able to sort of put your life in its hands, um, even though you've never seen it before. So abstraction is an incredibly powerful thing, but abstraction is extremely reductive, right? The car might be a hybrid car. It might be, you know, some new high-tech kind of engine. We don't really know how it works. Uh, in a, a similar way, I think any act of sort of building a computational model is that same kind of reduction. And so there's going to be design decisions that go into that. I think that's the sense in which data will be inevitably imbued with with bias. I think, you know, and now this is the part of the answer that I think, you know, is, you know, in some ways, you know, more aspirational than than concrete at the moment. But I think one of you know, one of the things I think is promising in, you know, in the kinds of, in, in the way research has been going over the past several years is, you know, the, the really rapidly widening scope of the conversation around the construction of data sets, the construction of computational models <clears throat> to sort of, un, you know, and understand both the computer science side and outside computer science, that this is, this is a, a sort of first order activity that, that everyone needs to participate in. Uh, this is not sort of inside any one field. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that I think is going to be a, a way to at least begin, begin making progress. Yeah, thanks so much. You know, so if if uh, I, I can just insert a couple of my own views, and then I'll have the next question, which is for uh, uh, Ruha Benjamin. You know, so you know, you know, I just wanted to say something because uh, my book, Phantasmal Media: An Approach to Imagination, Computation, and Expression, was on the screen I saw before I spoke, and the central idea is that while well, people often think of computing as uh, objective, utilitarian, and uh, acultural. Actually, computing implements various forms of subjectivity, is always cultural, and can be used to spark a criticality. And so, you know, I don't, you know, I didn't write you know, using exact, this was from a while ago, before the term algorithmic bias was quite in uh, parlance, you know, but one of the key, one of the key ideas was that all technical systems are cultural systems. And just as an example, even something like the stored program architecture, you know, the von Neumann machine, it's like in almost nearly every computing system we use, 
is grounded in the culture of its times. If you go back and read the original paper, it's not abstracted like the, the way we describe now. It describes input and output, quote unquote, organs of machines. And it says computers should be made of vacuum tube elements and all these other things that we have left by the wayside that are entirely grounded within its, its uh, time period and cultural history. And so I think it's just something we need to be aware of is that even systems we think of as most objective and acultural implement various forms of uh, culture. And uh, so the question that I have for uh, uh, Ruha, I, I think it it was sparked by something that uh, you know, that Benaz said, but I think that it uh, it's re it resonates with your talk as well, which is about tools of resistance. So Benaz spoke about artistic tools of resistance. You know, the question is broader, and you know, I think it's relevant for you because you talk about communities and how communities can resist against. Uh, of certain types of technologies you know, that uh, you know that impose bias and so the question is are tools of resistance ones that cannot be co-opted by those being resisted and if i can add are tools that cannot be co-opted even possible so yeah, anyway that's my question mm, yeah no i appreciate that and 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 just before i jump into this i also wanted to build on something else um, benaz was saying about the role of art the art um, in terms of our ethical framework. And I would say, you know, in terms of our imagination, uh, one of the things that I really want to insist upon is that the arts, it, it shouldn't be an afterthought. It shouldn't be something that we bring in, you know, after the algorithms are designed or after the technical system and in order to create kind of a sheen or a gloss, but really to understand that imagination is a battlefield and that in terms of imagination, certain imaginations are being codified in our technical systems. And one of the ways to understand the role of the arts is to radically expand our imagination through the questions that are asked, through the different frameworks that are brought to bear, ethical and otherwise. And so again, to understand the centrality of imagination and everything that we're doing, not simply in the realm that are dubbed the arts. And so that's that's something I just want to put on the table, which relates to this idea of tools. I don't think there are any tools that are immune from co-optation. And but what I would suggest is that, you know, in terms of trying to prevent that, understanding that tool making um one, it doesn't just apply to hardware and software. So one of the things that I really want us to consider are the many types of social tools, tools of interaction, relationality that don't really come to mind when we say the word technology. And so to have a much more expansive understanding of what counts as tools and to understand that, you know, in terms of the power, the, the way that power is laden in tools, it's not a one-time thing where you, you know, at the point of creation of something that it sets it off in a certain trajectory. Either we're helping the oppressed or empowering, you know, certain groups, but it's an ongoing battle. It's an ongoing form of resistance. And so in that case, I don't think that there's a way to immunize uh, uh, any of our technologies from co-optation or from being used in ways that were not intended. And so that's why we have to build into the process forms of accountability um, where we continually calibrate and think about if how and if this, these tools are being used to reinforce the status quo, reinforce power and inequality, or being used to subvert it and to transform it. And so it really has to be an ongoing process of accountability that's institutionalized, that's not simply left to individuals who may or may not have good intentions. I think the stakes are too high to think of the issues that we're wrestling with on this panel simply in terms of ethics or the ethics of individuals or even fields, but we really have to build, a, create an ecosystem, forms of regulation, accountability, protections that operate whether or not individuals have the best intentions. I think we can't rest our build our futures uh, on the well-meaning intent not to do harm, as important as that is. Right, so what I love in your response are 
well, I was going to say two things, but actually all of it, <laughs> but two things I'll call attention to in particular were one, this idea about computing as a tool. It's a very instrumental view of computing, you know, because computing can be used in so many broader ways, whether it's purely for, you know, the, uh, the kind of austere beauty of, of formalization, you know, or it could be something such as uh, in some of the, you know, the communities that I work in, seeing the computer as a medium, not just as a tool. So when you ask that question, can media be co-opted? You know, then it becomes a little bit more obvious, you know, than when you say, can a tool be uh, co-opted? And then finally, well, the reason I wanted to bring this together with a, a second point that you made was about the arts not being an afterthought, you know, because I think oftentimes that comes from when the arts are seen in an instrumental way. And so let's say if someone's applying for a National Science Foundation grant and then say, okay, I have my intellectual merit, arts will be, brought, will be broader impact. I'll bring in an artist afterwards and they can help me dis with dissemination. And so it's, you know, so when, you know, when arts are thought of as that in that instrumental way, it often leads to them being that kind of uh, afterthought. And so the next question is for uh, Benaz, which is, I think, related to this idea of an instrumental view of, you know, of uh, of technologies being uh, you know, co-opted. Yeah, and so, you know, the question is asking about your thoughts around gender that stem from your work and the way that, uh, you know, that, that your, your work you know, operates as a critique of heteronormativity, of heterosexual normativity. And, uh, but they're also wondering about the ways that uh, heterosexual normativity might be reinforced uh, by this kind of work. And then they ask you know, how a kind of gender fluid, gay, uh, a, a gender fluid perspective on the issue of gays or a, a perspective influenced by queer theory might inform your work uh, differently. And then just as the final you know, editorial remark on their question, you know, because we talked about deep learning, I mean, with deep fake technologies, the major way that they're being used, like the most prevalent use is actually a sexual objectification, like you mentioned, and in, in fact, creating uh, nude pictures of celebrities and so forth. You know, that's the most uh, prevalent use of those technologies out there, which seems very related to this idea of the, the sexualizing gaze. So what would the lenses of gender fluidity and queer theory bring to the kind of work that you do? Wow, that's that's a difficult one, but I'll try to uh, answer as best as I can. Um, so it's it's fascinating because, uh, for instance, in Chris of the Gaze, the the project that tracked the gaze of the onlooker, um, I was using a system that it was pre-trained. I was using a pre-trained model that it was. Um, basically able to, uh, or sort of predicting the gender in a very binary way, uh, which we know is very problematic, um, if there is a male or a female. Um, so um, as a designer, although I use both uh, systems that they are trained based on sort of pre-trained data, or in some cases, I train the system with uh, certain data, um, I think it's fascinating to just uh, kind of um, address these issues, particularly, as you mentioned, regarding, let's say, gender fluidity. Can computational system really predict through the pure representation our identification? And I think, Fox, from that point of view, your work particularly actually addressed these issues that how uh, our identity is being represented in um, virtual environments. Um, and um, I think a, a lot of times for me is to sort of either use them or uh, kind of question them. Um, I think uh, also uh, I have to mention that this notion of essentialism, um, which is very dominant in feminist discourse, um, could we actually say that there is anything essential about being a female, being a female and having a female experience? Uh, obviously, it's been in um, a sort of Western way of thinking, um, and there are um, many theories that question that sort of essentialism in art and design practices. Having said that, also, I have to acknowledge that coming from a culture that it's mainly male dominant, um, you are still struggling with a lot of sort of these gender binary differences. Um, so uh, I don't have a sort of uh, 
answer how computational systems could address the gender fluidity because it's ab absolutely uh, complicated topic but i think it's also very very interesting to think about like how are we going to represent our identities so i would like to also hear from you fox what what are your thoughts on that uh, sure yeah so i can speak briefly and, and then i have another question for john and so one is i try to reconcile between domains by you know so i mentioned a computer science speech but i also have degrees in uh, Art as you know, as well, and so one of the things I have to do then is think about the values within each domain. You know, so is it something like generalizability? Is it is is it a value like how exhaustive and efficient is this particular algorithm that I've created, or is it something like can the system spark criticality? You know, and yeah, within society, or can it even be used practical? And can you, this is you know, maybe more like some of the work in the social sciences, can you demonstrate that this work yeah, empirically you know, sparks uh, reflection, say using some kind of validated instrument. And so when reconciling between those uh, domains, uh, you know, then I often find insights such as when critiquing a system, let's say a computer science system that was created to, uh, you know, to, to help girls learn mathematics, then you can ask questions such as, but what, you know, what model of gender is the system working under? Is this a biolo biological positivist model of gender in which all girls are assumed to learn in the same kind of way? Or is it something you know, where their girl girlhood is not necessarily understood to be something which is monolithic across them? And so then you can interrogate the technical practices in a very different way when you begin to think about how it's instantiating particular sets of values. And, and, and so I think what you were mentioning in particular I have one pat patented co computational system, which is for representing identity very differently than in the top-down way many computational systems do. It's essentially not trying to put you into a box you know, by some set number of uh, fields, but actually implements fluidity. You know, that is, you have a trajectory in which you naturalize into categories, degrees of membership in categories, multiple categories. So your identity isn't fixed at any one particular location. And it can be applied to so many different things, like ranging from music, you know, because our tastes might be different in the morning than in the evening, or it could, you know, or some of the more you know, the, the kind of issues of bias that we've spoken about in conversation here. But I'll leave it at that, and then, yeah, and, then uh, and you know, maybe we could continue uh, later. But I, maybe I want I can to just, just say one more thing, oh, sure. Fox. Um, that um, this somehow we are co complicit in this. I mean, the fact that we already have LGBTQ, we have this form of identification that at the end people have to put themselves in the boxes to identify as one of those categories. This would sort of originates from that point of view and then kind of replicates in our computational systems. So my point is that it's the, the issue is so complex because in our actual way that we are also identifying in the society. We are constantly creating these boxes that you mentioned, and we add more categories. And we think that by adding more, more categories, everyone should find their own identification. But we truly have to question um, uh, how we operate um, uh, even in the society in the first place, rather than sort of how this system also replicate in, in computational systems. Right. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I mean, I, I use the term box effects to describe all the kind of discriminatory fallout that comes from that kind of taxonomic perspective on uh, identity and maybe more evocatively, Jeff Bowker and Lee Star, Lee Star with the term identity torque, this idea that when you don't fit into those identity categories reinforced by society, it actually produces torque on the individual. You know, that is actual you know, emotional pain because people have experiences that they can't uh, reconcile with how they see themselves. You know, and you know, so there's so, so much more we can, uh, we can say uh, about this, but you know, such, such important points. And so one question that we have from, uh, you know, from the audience, actually from uh, Will Lockett, who is one of the uh, uh, you know, co-organizers of you know, the uh, you know, Unfolding Intelligence Symposium, you know, asked about the capacity of mathematics to represent, so I'll use his terms and then I'll also say the way that I interpret it, which is uh, the capricious specificity of individual behavior as in some agent-based uh, simulation. And I think really it's very similar to the first question that uh, I asked, uh, or actually the ending question in the Q&A after John's session, which was, is computing, is using mathematical approaches 
always going to be reductive? Or is there some way that those approaches can be used you know, that uh, are complementary to other types of you know, approaches and are not necessarily going to be reductive in harmful ways? Um, yeah, it's a, a great question. And <clears throat> I mean, I think it's, it's sort of a question that comes up a lot when we talk about building mathematical models of of the world um and i think you know in particular mathematical models of the social world and you know it it already begins with you know the, the fact that i think a lot of our you know a lot of people's education sort of trains them in the intuitions around building mathematical models of simple physical systems and there's always this sort of optimistic sense that maybe i can take what i learned there and begin to uh, apply it to um situations in the social world and and obviously you know we run into an enormous number of challenges there, in particular that the state of the world in, in the case of the social world typically is, uh, ex you know, has an extremely long description, right? In, in, in the language of features, it, it's extremely wide. There are many, many different things that I know about an individual, um, what their experiences are, uh, what, what, their, what their actions are, what their motivations and intents are. And as a result, to re re represent that, you know, it's something where we, we, we can't really hope to Fully either know or or uh, represent all those things, and that's why uh, I think we end up with some of these um, some of these challenges. So, I, you know, I think I'm, um, you know, I personally tend toward optimism that this is an activity that we should be engaging in because I, I think it's a valuable uh, sort of supplement to the 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 kinds of discussions which are taking place. But we certainly, I don't think, see any evidence that it's a you know it's a substitute for these 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 other forms of analysis, right? I think it 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 supplements it. And it, it, if we think of it as a supplement, you know, then we can begin to look for ways, you know, in the spirit that I think, you know, um has been been true in all the talks. And you know, I, I think Ben Oz that you you service very powerfully the multiple uses of the same, you know, the same tool or the same methodology, you know, to look for ways in which um, you know, reductiveness can, you know, some, some sometimes expose commonalities across situations that we think of as very different. Um, and I think it, if that's done in in partnership with a conversation that recognizes the differences across these domains, then it can establish linkages that may actually pr pr provoke further thinking. I think if it's done to the, you know, in the absence of, the, of that, 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 that conversation, then it, it just ends up obscuring, uh, in, 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 obscuring important distinctions. Right. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it, it reminds me of a statement made by the late great uh, computer scientist uh, Joseph Gogan, who who you know, said something to the effect of, you know, "We can describe subjective social phenomena in uh, subjective ways, you know, critical ways, and we can also describe them in precise ways. And it doesn't. None of these it gives additional authority to the analysis. They're just different languages for doing the analysis. And so when you say complementary, I feel like that's one of the keys: just understanding whether it's the imaginative, like uh, like uh, you know, like Benaz's and, and uh, Ruha's work uh, as well, because I've seen her, her yeah, work bridge with the uh, arts uh, too. Yeah, or the you know the mathematical. You know, it's uh, you know, it's just different lenses that again can be complementary in addressing related uh, r related issues. And uh, so I wanna also just, uh, you know, since we have just a few more minutes left, ask if any of the panelists have questions for one another. Um, I'll, I'll take the opportunity, not, not necessarily to pose a question, but just to be in conversation. And, and, and two quick things, one is on your last point, Fox about the compliment, or and also John's point about the complementarity. I, I want us to think about that in relation to the very real hierarchies of knowledge in the academy. That while ideally these fields would be complementary, there are certain forms of knowledge that have more that are granted more authority and more legitimacy. That even in collaboration, trump other forms of knowledge, and they fall along predictable lines, hard to soft the qualitative, the quantitative, et cetera. And at the same time, I, I just want to say that we've spent some time talking about the relationship between computation and reductive, racist, sexist forms of hierarchy. But I also want to call my own fields into complicity, the social sciences and the humanities, 
and that storytelling can be just as violent <laughs> and just as reductive in terms of infusing all kinds of meaning in the world. So it's not simply on the statistical or the computational side that this kind of reckoning needs to happen, but also in the humanities and social sciences that have been some of the major producers of this racist architecture that we still inhabit. And so no field is immune from the kind of questions and um, reckoning that I think we're talking about. They're such important points. You know, they both call to mind this notion of cultural humility, which often is not used related to academic disciplines, but I think you give an exact, uh, a good description of why it should be applied to those, uh, to those such uh, disciplines. And so we're, you know, you know, we're coming down to just our uh, last, uh, last uh, seconds here. You know, so uh, I appreciated that final remark in terms of bringing the different ideas into conversation with uh, one another. I would like just to welcome if uh, John and then uh, Benaz have just very brief closing remarks uh, too. You know, then then we we can have, we can do so, and then end the panel. Um, I, yeah, I, first of all, I would say, you know, it's been a, a privilege to be able to, to take part in the conversation, you know, with, um, uh, with all of you and, uh, you know, I, uh, with the insights that have been expressed across different fields and Fox, thanks very much for your moderation of the panel, because I think your work really has sort of, um, encompasses so many of the themes that we've been seeing here and, you know, has been, I think, inspirational to, you know, to, uh, a lot of people, including myself. And I think what, you know what this panel sort of embodies in microcosm is certainly the 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 type of analysis which you know i sort of you know think on the computational side that you know i think uh people have been increasingly asp aspiring to to actually you know bring the the mathematical formalism and the models you know into a a, a closer conversation you know both with the arts and the social sciences and to understand how it can you know, inform that discussion, um, you know, without, as Ruha said, sort of overly dominating that discussion. And thanks so much. It's being of cultural humility. You made me feel uh, very humble in your remarks, uh, too, as well as appreciating your insights. So, uh, 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 Benaz, can you yes. uh, also so, share a final remark? Uh, of course. And I just want to very briefly echo um, um, uh, uh, John's comments and 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 I I want to say that also thank you Fox for organizing this panel. I've learned from all the speakers here. I think um, the opportunities for uh, artists and designers um, and um, to learn from other disciplines, but also have the sort of uh, uh, transdisciplinary approach and that can learn and borrow from each discipline. It's incredible in this period of time. So I'm extremely excited um, about the possibility of learning from other disciplines and bringing those ideas into uh, my own discipline in art and design. Um, so thank you so much for creating and uh, fostering this platform. Well, thank you so much. And I want to finally just extend heartfelt thanks to uh, Ruha, John, and Benaz for agreeing to join this uh, panel. I've learned so much and been so inspired by all of the things that you have said. And also thanking the co-conveners of the, the symposium and, uh, and, uh, you know, the, and you know, those who came up with the idea of unfolding intelligence as a convening yeah, maybe a year or more ago, and to see it finally come into fruition in you know, this time of great reckoning we find ourselves in right now. So it's uh, you know, just an astounding and impressive and valuable feat you know, to bring us all together here. So thank you very much. Thanks our audience. Thank you, thank you to our audience as well, and have a great rest of the symposium. <laughs>